morning. There's a small flurry of concern going on right now on YouTube about censorship again because some of the amazing atheist videos were taken down about 10 or something like that and it's just the latest ripple in this ongoing concern to do with the, the influence that large corporations or organisations more generally have on our freedom of speech with this word censorship being thrown up and particularly in relation to um, in this case atheism or is a particular sector of the population whose opinions are so dangerous and so volatile that we have to silence them you know, is, is revolution afoot if the amazing atheist is allowed to have freedom of speech? Well, it's nothing, I'm, I'm, there's no evidence of that, and I'd, I'd be very, very surprised. I don't think there's a, a secret cabal of, of influential people in Google headquarters deciding that, we, that the amazing atheist and atheists in general have got something against, or are a dangerous force that has got to be silenced. I don't think there's any, um, any kind of government influence on that. It's just the kind of banal evil, I would say, the banal evil, if I can quote uh, Hannah Arendt, of, uh, of business as usual, really. You know, the only, the only um, criteria that Google worked to were the bottom line and brand identity management, didn't they, really? They have a responsibility to their shareholders, they would say, to deliver a good product which is family-friendly and which uh, turns a profit. And these, uh, these processes are all part of that. But, uh, but I do think it's interesting to think how, they, how that's working, because it, it used to be the case, at least um, I believe, that videos that were flagged or reviewed, there's a, there's a video on Blip now, I think it's been up there a few years, of uh, Victoria Grand, who at that time I think was head of marketing, something like that, for YouTube, and she described how the, how the reviewing and flagging process worked then, um, in which it was, at least it was claimed all flagged videos were reviewed by a human reviewer, not the videos themselves, they would see a selection of, um, of screen grabs, of frames from the video, along with a little bit of textual information from the description and so on, and would make a call based on that. Um, but I have no doubt at all, I mean that, that system was crap as we know, but there's always been flags which were, I would regard as illegitimate, I think most people would. Because even under that system, a human reviewer probably has between 10 and 15 seconds to look at these uh, individual frames of a video and make a choice. And of course, if you see graphic nudity or graphic violence that's clearly, or something clearly illegal, then that's a, it's a no-brainer. But most of the time, or a lot of the time at least, um, these are humans and, and humans make errors. But there's no, but you know, it's no doubt in my mind at all that that doesn't exist now. There's no, there's no possibility of that. Like I think it's something like a hundred hours are uploaded to YouTube. Hundred hours of footage every minute, and a lot of that is illegal. You know, I have no doubt about it. You know, there's a lot of really hardcore porn uploaded. There's a lot of um, copyrighted material uploaded. A lot of privacy infringing material. So all that kind of stuff is going on. There's no doubt in my mind about that. Come on, please. Um, so the flags must keep coming far too quickly, far too often to, for human reviewers, even working in third world countries on minimum wage, to be able to uh, keep track of that. So it's done algorithmically, isn't it? It's, it's automated. Uh, and they have so much data that that algorithm, whatever the algorithm is, now I wish they were more transparent just because I'm fascinated to find out how it works. But the, uh, the, the amount of data that they've got about each video is such that they can do very complex things, I think, you know, to, to um, build criteria in for why a video might be contravening terms of service or something like that. I mean, we know that they've got uh, algorithms for recognising flesh tones, for example. They've had those for four or five years. Not that they're any good, but, you know, if a video's got lots of flesh tones, that would send up a warning signal. It used to be the case when, under the old human reviewing system, that if a video had lots of flesh tones and had been flagged, it was put to the top of the reviewer's list. So they would look at those first, because there was a high probability there would be pornography. Uh, but as I say, without human reviewers, that flesh tone, the presence of flesh tones in videos, would, um, it would be a kind of weighting, it would, it would, there'd be a kind of numerical equivalent to that. But it, rec it figured into some kind of algorithm somewhere, and put alongside a lot of other information which might uh, contribute towards the evaluation of whether a video is, is illegitimate or not. So, for example, the, um, the words that we put in the titles and the description, of course, 
if you've got lots of swear words in there or lots of mentions of terrorism, bomb, you know, those kinds of things, they would, they would undoubtedly be featured as well. But given that all our spoken videos are also um, transcribed automatically, I know it's very flawed, but the, uh, there is an automatic uh, speech-to-text recognition program that runs here, isn't there? We can bring it up with using the captions thing in the thing below. All that information is undoubtedly there as well. So even if I don't put words like, like swear words in my description or in my title or, or mention terrorism or something like that in there, it, just the fact that I am talking about it, I imagine would, would also feature as part of the evaluation. So there'd be something like a numerical equivalent of those things going on as well, which would be adding to the, the risk value of a particular video. So something like flesh tones, something like swear words and, and, and trigger words of various kinds. Also, factors to do with the, um, the reputation of the video maker. You know, whether a particular video maker has been flagged before and it was a legitimate flag, i.e. if it appealed and their appeal was found to be uh, was refused. Uh, reputation to do with, you know, how long have they been on YouTube? Is this, is this a brand new account with no information, no avatar, no links across to a Google Plus account or to a blogger account, no traceable information? What's the reputation of the uploader? That would be a factor I have no doubt would be in there. What was the reputation of the flagger? The person who's reported this video, is, there, did, is that a new account? Is that a person who's flagged videos before? When they did flag videos before and the video flag was appealed, was the appeal successful or was it a failure? Is the reputation of the flagger good or is it bad? Um, again, what's the reputation of that flagger off YouTube? We all have connected accounts here. Um, I wouldn't be at all surprised if information is being drawn from whatever links we put on our About page not just to our Google Plus or Blogger accounts, but probably also places like Twitter, anything or Facebook, anything else we put on there. Information is, is drawn across to give us, a, to give, in this case, Google a kind of um, reputation of evaluation. How legitimate are we? And also, I imagine, so that would be a factor that we're build into the algorithm when it's trying to, which is automatically trying to decide whether this video is, it's, it's um, calibrating, it's doing its metrics on, is that it's legitimately flaggable or not, it should be removed. To do with reputation, to do with reputation of the flagger, to do with flesh tones, to do with words in the description and title and transcription. But also to do with um, the status of the of the, the YouTuber in terms of their value to, to Google. Are they are they making money for the channel? Are they um, a network partner? Are they networked into other network partners? Are they part of a, a larger um, related network of subscribers and subscriptions, which also um, could be affected by a negative flag? Because, of course, what Google and YouTube doesn't want from the perspective of its shareholders, from the perspective of its brand identity management as a family-friendly station, what it doesn't want is to have ripples of disquiet running too widely, too far from the, through its systems. So there'll be, I imagine, um, uh, an algorithmic check on the kind of network that that person whose video is, is under review is uh, how that person is networked in. Do they have influential friends who can cause problems for them across the network? I would imagine with all that, and probably lots more besides that I haven't thought about, there'd be, I'd be surprised if there wasn't 30 or 40 different factors that are built into that evaluation um, metric, that system by which a video is reviewed after having been flagged, automatically reviewed by a piece of software and judged to be probably in, in contravention. And when I say in contravention, I don't mean in contravention the terms of service because they're written in such a way that anything could be in contravention and also nothing could be if it was so judged. But in contravention of, a, of the family-friendly income-generating processes which a YouTube as a private company has to have as its bottom line. Uh, so 30 or 40 different 
factors will weigh into that. And each one of those can be tweaked. You know, it would be a very simple job just to, to alter the weighting of this or that factor, just to change it a wee bit. And that would be done, I imagine, on an ongoing basis. It will be a dynamic process by which these factors are tweaked and changed. So it's given slightly more weighting to the, um, to the reputation of a, of a video maker or giving slightly more weighting to the presence of flesh tones or the presence of certain words. Those things would be, could be modifiable. And feedback would be generated. It wouldn't be feedback according to whether you or I are pissed off about it or not. It would be feedback about you know, overall um, market penetration or overall income overall um, advertiser satisfaction, that kind of thing, the metrics that count to an organisation that's concerned about its brand identity and its bottom line. Um, and of course there may be mistakes, but of course there won't be terrible mistakes. There certainly wouldn't be mistakes from YouTube's point of view. There might be huge mistakes from our point of view when sudden changes take place. But uh, they wouldn't be concerned about individuals. Individuals would never be looked at. No one's going to think, oh we can't take down the amazing atheist because people won't like that. No, that, that, that would never be a factor. No, this isn't censorship. This is more like climate control. The climate control, the winds that blow across all of us, the winds of, that take some people out and take some videos out, but maintain the overall climate which is conducive to the, to the growth of the coffers in, in Google, to Google's coffers or is conducive to the growth of a family-friendly brand identity for YouTube. <laughs> no, that's how I think it works.